Well, I want to welcome you all to the nadir of the afternoon, where we are about to experience just um, what I'm sure is going to be a wonderful presentation. I am such a fan of Kathy Prelwitz and her presentations. I'm really, really very pleased to have her on the program. Uh, Kathy's topic is community college, educational opportunity, or psychiatric institution. That will be the question we'll have to answer. And Kathy is speaking from personal experience because she teaches English and philosophy at Ridgewater Community College in Hutchinson, Minnesota. Kathy earned her master's degree at the University of Chicago. She has a bachelor's degree from St. Mary's College in Indiana. Um, and she's recently been getting into the world of retail property ownership and renovation and management. And it just happens that also she lives on an active farm, you know, the kind where they really farm to make money, that kind of farm, with her husband and four children. So, you know, a little farming, pretty much full-time professor, you know, investment, um, you know, pretty awesome, actually, Kathy. And, and Kathy's been attending our graduate seminar for several years now, and uh, it's been wonderful working with her on advanced uh, objectivism topics. So please give a warm welcome to Kathy Prowitz. Thank you, Will. <clears throat> so I just I want to give you a little bit of background or information about myself and about my education. Education was always very important to me, even as a high school student. I really cherish being in the classroom and learning. The world of learning and intellectual stimulation was my interest, and I learned that really quickly. As a senior in high school, I won a scholarship to travel to Germany to be an exchange student. Upon my return, I left my hometown of Mandan, North Dakota, and took off to study at St. Mary's College in Indiana and enjoyed classes at St. Mary's in Notre Dame. Loved them, loved the intellectual environment, and I knew that's where I wanted to be forever. Shortly after that, I took off for, an, you know, I graduated from college and was a really good liberal. So I took off to uh, volunteer for the AmeriCorps program. After that, I left to be a nanny in Germany again, then came back, got married, dragged my husband off to Chicago, where I pursued my master's degree in the, at the University of Chicago. For me, education was everything. I loved education. I loved the classroom. And at that point, I really knew that my future was going to be in the classroom, albeit I knew I couldn't be a student forever. Couldn't afford it. So I figured I better take up teaching. And I finally got that opportunity when my husband and I, when we bought his family's farm in Minnesota, it's a rural community west of Minneapolis. There was an advertisement in the newspaper. They were looking for an adjunct professor of English. I applied. And after navigating my way toward the interview, because it was the day after a very bad tornado that destroyed the small town by where we live, <laughs> I finally got there and I was offered the job, and I was thrilled. But then I had a moment of, moment of panic. I know how to be a student. <laughs> how do I teach this? <laughs> so the first step was to devise a syllabus. And my method for devising the syllabus was to simply use the method of education I'd been given read some books, and write some papers. It worked fairly well for the summer class. It was a small class, and usually the summer classes are filled with students who are really devoted to trying to get their education done quickly, and so they're, they're expecting the compressed schedule, and they're committed, and they work hard. So the syllabus I had used, based on the methods that had been used to teach me, worked for the summer. When I was offered classes for the fall in both English and philosophy, I can't say I was a quick learner, but I slowly came to realize that the method with which I had been taught was not going to work at the community college. What I would slowly come to realize after teaching at the community college is that contrary to what I had always believed, not everyone is capable of achieving a college education. Not everyone who is there really wants to be there and achieve a college education. And not everyone can truly benefit from a college education. Not, at least not in the way our society seems to currently endorse. Let me paint a picture of, for you of the kinds of students I have 
been introduced to since becoming a teacher at the community college. First, we have those who are truly preparing for a four-year degree. They are, they are the obvious ones in the classroom. We also have in Minnesota what are called PSEO students. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. This is called post-secondary education option. This is where high school students are able to enroll in uh, local community colleges and even you know, four-year colleges so that they can get some of their college credits under their belt. And so they get dual credit for high school and college. I've had students, I've had some high school students walk for the college graduation, of receiving their AA degree before they even walk for their high school d diploma. It's fascinating. We also have a lot of displaced workers, especially in the town where I live. We have a business called HTI, the owner of which is very dedicated to Ayn Rand's philosophy. Unfortunately, they have fallen on some difficult times and have been laying off quite a few workers who many are coming back to the community college to re-educate themselves. I also have a lot of curious elderly people. I can't say a lot of them. I've had a few. Just older people who just, you know, are looking for something to fill their time. I had one in particular. He was, I bet you he was 70 years old. Former Vietnam vet. A lot of fun to have in class. He'd show up drunk occasionally. <laughs> then one day he fell in the driveway during the winter, broke his hip, and he ended up, he ended up dying halfway through a semester. Kind of just crazy stories. I have a lot of recovering addicts in our area. And uh, what brings them to school, for a lot of them, they're, you know, they've just finished treatment and they're looking for the next step in their lives and they show up at the, at the community college trying to figure out where they're going and what they're doing. I have a lot of active addicts. Many of these are using schools in, as an excuse to not go to jail. They show up before the judge and tell them, I'm enrolled in school, you can't send me to jail. And I have a lot, actually, several criminals. Criminal pass, and um, they too are just looking for a, for a path, something new. But let me tell you about a couple of my students. And these are the ones with the disability, you know, because we have several, and this has become obvious to me through the years, that there are many that enter the school with severe mental disabilities. Early in my career as a philosophy instructor, I had a young man who it became, and it became very clear that he was suffering from schizophrenia. According to him, he was sent by God to be the protector of women, women, sort of a saint, protecting all women. He had even written a book and had kindly given me a copy to read. I was hesitant, but awfully curious. So I picked it up and I read it. The entire book was about all the signs he had been given from God, of course, every single one of them, telling him about what his path was going to be, protect all women. Specifically, he was sent to protect his ex-girlfriend, who now had a restraining order against him. <laughs> one day he came back to my office to talk a little bit about, you know, if I had read the book and what I thought. I quickly realized my office was much too secluded for this student <laughs> to be alone with him. As he talked about the, jo the job that God had given him, he became increasingly agitated, and he spoke of the new challenge he had been given. Namely, the devil had arrived in the form of his ex-girlfriend's best friend, who was spreading rumors and lies about him all over the campus. And now his job had been made even more difficult, protecting the ex-girlfriend was going to be very hard. He became so agitated about this woman, believing she was actually a devil, the defender of women, woman, as I had called him, suddenly was using every obscene and awful word in the book to describe this girl. Now, I found it fairly offensive, and I was a little, like, a little scared, to be honest, to be trapped with this student. But I was calm and I just listened, fearful that if I raised any questions, he might misconstrue me as the devil's right-hand man. So I listened, he finally calmed down. And as he was leaving my office, he was putting his earbuds in his ear and he said, using these is the only way I can keep the voices away. 
As he left, I remember thinking how sad it was that he really believed he was going to go off to work as an advocate and counselor for abused women. Given his illness and the behavior I witnessed that day, it was quite clear that this student was going to be absolutely unemployable in his chosen field of study, and yet straddled with enormous college debts. Sadly, this was not an isolated case. The next semester, in the introduction, the introduction to college-level writing class I teach, I'd assign a number of books to read to my students, which we would discuss in class, and then my students would go out where, well, they were asked, anyway, to go off and write a series of uh, three to five page critical analyses on each book. This is how I learned to write in college, and this is how I was planning to teach my students. In this particular class, we had read a book by Ishmael Bay called A Long Way Gone. This is a, a book by a man, it's a memoir about his uh, experience as a boy soldier in Sierra Leone during the Sierra Leone Civil War. And um, he weaves all kinds of short stories from his oral tradition throughout the book. And at the end of the book, he tells a tale. And he says that it was a popular story for parents to tell their, their children. And it, it was this, a moral dilemma it would give them. And the kids were then expected to go off and talk about, you know, what is the moral lesson of this? What would you do? This particular story was about a, a hunter who went into the jungle and ran into a talking monkey. And the monkey says to the hunter, if you kill me, your mother will die. If you don't kill me, your father will die. So the kids were all asked, what would you do? And he said they would all have great fun running off and talking about this. Clearly, Ishmael Bey is using the story, this story in his memoir to illustrate the catch-22 that existed for people in Sierra Leone during the Civil War. There were no good choices, no good options. I had one student who was absolutely incapable of abstract thought. And, and I'm not joking. When he came to class, we had to spend 20 minutes as a class trying to convince him that there are not talking monkeys in Africa. <laughs> he truly believed, he was astounded that there were talking monkeys in Africa. The abstract, to try to find the, the deeper message, the reason, it, it was beyond his ability. Needless to say, I became incredibly frustrated after a few years. These two students ultimately passed my class, but only after many, many hours of personal tutoring outside the classroom. As I was given more classes to teach, the number of students needing additional help continued to mount. I no longer had time in the day to give them all the one-on-one -on -one attention they needed. In addition to that, I began to question if they were actually really earning the grades they were getting. The whole idea was for them to go on and be able to do this on their own. And I was no longer sure, given how much help I was giving them, that they would be able to do that. The greater challenge, however, was trying to find a way of teaching that would continue to challenge the brighter students, while at the same time giving those with serious challenges a fighting chance to pass the class all while attempting to be fair in expectations and assessment. After many conversations with my English colleagues, we decided that I should teach the developmental English class the following semester so that I could get a better understanding of where many of these students were coming from. <laughs> it was like going to a circus, to be honest. First, I had to figure out what I was expected to teach in a developmental class. I had no idea. And so I had to get a quick primer, and here's what goes on in the community college. In a, I mean, clearly, when you apply, if you're going to apply to Harvard, you don't even bother unless you are in the upper echelons of your class. And even then, you may not be accepted. Community colleges cannot discriminate based on academic ability. If you apply and you have a way to pay or secure funding to pay, you are accepted. The only requirement is that you have to take a placement exam. 
And the placement exams, as far as I know, are, are for English and for math. If you place, if you pass the, if you score high enough on the exam, you are allowed to register then for college level classes in math and English. If your score is below that level, then you have to sign up for the developmental classes. And in English, we have two sets of developmental classes. There are two developmental writing classes and two developmental reading classes. So if you have a very low score, you'll be in the first developmental class, followed by the second, and then you can get into the college level writing class. And typically, if they, they test into the college level writing, they're also in the college level reading. In the first college level writing class, just to give you an idea of what exactly they are teaching there, you begin with learning how to construct a sentence. That is the start. The goal by the end of the semester is to be able to construct a cohesive paragraph. In the upper developmental class, which is the one I was teaching, you begin with a cohesive paragraph, and the goal for the end of the semester is a complete five-paragraph essay. Now, kind of as a side note, one of the real dilemmas that set a lot of these students up for failure is that even if you test into, let's say, the lower level you know, developmental writing and reading classes, you're not allowed to sign up for a college level literature class, but you can sign up for philosophy. <laughs> so I get to have these students in developmental reading, and I'm trying to get them to read Nietzsche and Aristotle and Kant, and it's very frustrating to say the least. <laughs> So, sorry, I've gotten ahead of myself here. Teaching this class, this upper level uh, developmental class, showed me the incredible deficit some of these students bring with them to, community, to the community college. Either because of a substandard primary education or more often because of traumatic life experiences that have all but destroyed some of these people, or because of sheer intellectual inability, which I, for a long time, tried to not acknowledge. It also began to show me the incredible burden placed on teachers when everyone and anyone is accepted for enrollment. In my first developmental English class, I had several I will never forget all in the same class at once. There was a severely autistic young man who could not make eye contact, who could not share a thought verbally, let alone get it constructed on paper. There was a young girl who had been raped by her father and was left to fend for herself while he served a prison term. There was an older gentleman who was actually the best writer in the class. But his bigger challenge was a meth addiction which was very obvious from the very few rotten teeth left in his mouth and the sores all over his face. He was arrested before the end of the semester and I never saw him again. There was also an endearing young man full of tattoos, but who I thought had a lot of potential. He was very dedicated, he worked really hard. I was really hopeful he would be my first you know, success story. Somebody one day pointed out to me that there was a reason for the teardrop tattoos under his eye. So out of curiosity, I went on Google and, and looked up his name. Found a mugshot and found out he had served time in prison for murder in Chicago. How he ended up in my rural town of Minnesota, I will never know. And he was arrested not too long after that as well and disappeared. These are just four of the incredibly tragic lives that I experienced in just one classroom of 19 students. And they were only the most tragic. After a few years of teaching, I began attending a conference each fall with my English colleagues. It's a conference that addresses how to teach English effectively in a community college. Aside from developing a challenging curriculum that is fair, consistent, and a challenge for all students in the classroom. The other issue is devising assignments that don't risk turning the instructor into a therapist. 
And at this particular conference just last fall, there was one presenter who actually made the claim that 50 years ago, half of your students would have been in a psychiatric institution. Today, they are in your classroom. The question quickly became, what do we do? I, while I think she may have been exaggerating, exaggerating the numbers a bit, I don't think it's 50%, but it's a, it's a good number, <laughs> I believe. What she said rang a bell. And the ensuing discussion in that room confirmed that most of us teaching at the community college have encountered the same kinds of mental illnesses and incredibly tragic life stories. And we all had to face the same challenges they present. The discussion focused in that session on how to sterilize assignments enough to prevent the teachers from becoming confidants to these students who sometimes have stories that are almost too unbearable to read about. And you wouldn't believe how open so many of these students are about these experiences. That's the biggest shocker. And yet then we have to turn around and grade these papers for punctuation and grammar. One instructor said he had grown so tired of the tragic stories, he had attempted to sterilize his, assignment, his assignments as much as possible. And in one assignment he had given, it was to write a five paragraph essay on your happy place. Three reasons why your happy place is your happy place. He said much to his shock, he really thought he was just gonna get all kinds of, you know, my happy place is the park, cause I, you know, I can run around and sit and whatever. One girl described in her five paragraph essay, the crawl space in the, under the stairs in her house. Because it was the only place where she could escape the physical, mental, and sexual abuse of her father. I came back to my classroom last fall with new eyes. I saw my students in new ways, and I began to ask new questions. The real dilemma before the realization, before this realization, was that I struggled precisely because I kept looking at myself and asking, what can I do to help these students? How do I need to change this classroom atmosphere to help them be successful? Understand the dilemma. In one classroom, I had a student who ended up believing in talking monkeys. And also a student in the same classroom who ended up going on to receive a 50% scholarship at William Mitchell Law School. It is an internationally known and respected school. How does an instructor challenge both ends of this spectrum while remaining fair in the matter of classroom expectations and assessment? How does the instructor challenge the mind of the brightest without completely, completely losing the least. While I certainly believe a certain amount of flexibility is needed in the classroom to try to reach as many students as possible, I have more, more often been asking myself new questions. Why are some of these students in college at all? And the other one, are they even capable of succeeding? What are we trying to do with some of these students? It has become increasingly evident that no matter how much help I offer, no matter how much I alter the classroom environment, discussion or expectations, there are some who are there with ulterior motives, like escaping jail. There are some who just simply don't want to be there, but they don't think they have any other place to be or go. And they are, there are some with deficits so severe, they will never be able to use their college education even if they are able to complete. The real problem I have discovered is that we as a society have placed such a premium on college education that almost no self-respecting high school student dare think of not obtaining one. Whether he actually wants it or not, the college degree, it seems, has come to be considered the magic ticket to a successful future for everyone. The reality is that for many, this will never be the case. Recall the student who believes in talking monkeys now. I will forever feel a burden that I'm responsible for the talking monkey in his mind. 
But eventually he did complete his two-year degree, and it did not take, it took more than two years. I'll just say that. But he finished his two-year degree, and on the day he was walking through graduation and he received his diploma, I had a colleague lean over and whisper in my ear, she had also had him in class, she said, you know what the sad thing is? He's never going to be more than a stock boy at Cashwise, which is our local grocery store. Five years later, just last week, I ran into somebody who works with this young man. And today he works as a dishwasher at the local grocery store. Only now he's a dishwasher with a college loan to repay. Now, if he had actually chosen the college path on his own and paid for it by himself, that would be one thing. My fear, however, is that the reality is that many of the psychologically ill are pushed into college by their caregivers because they don't know what else to do with them. And there is a persisting idea that a college education is going to open doors magically to a brighter future. It can and it will for some, but not for everyone. College has been sold in this country as a necessity. Without it, people are told, it seems, that they are less valuable. College education has been pushed upon as a value upon people, especially the young ones, and they are left with the idea that they cannot su succeed without one. And we seem to endorse this view. Consider the fact that today, a person cannot become a manager at McDonald's without a four-year degree. It is a corporate requirement. If you have someone who works at McDonald's for 10 years, and even perhaps works as an assistant manager, he cannot become a manager without investing the 30 or $40,000, 50, 60, however, it however much it costs these days, for a piece of paper saying he's got a four-year degree. Then he can manage McDonald's. The same is true at Menards. I noticed a sign on the Menards door last week. Menards is, I think, a regional store, but it's much like Home Depot. You need a four-year degree to manage Menards. And I'm thinking to myself, there are a lot of really successful construction workers, plumbers, who have run their own business for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, who might be looking for a change, maybe something with a more consistent paycheck. Only now they're being told that they cannot manage Menards because they don't have the four-year degree. Never mind the extensive experience. What's more is that even in the technical fields, the program requirements have been devised to make them bear more resemblance to a traditional college education. In other words, why do I continue to see NDT students sitting in my English classes? They are required by the colleges to be there, and many don't want to be there. Many are angry that they have to be there. And they're angry st angrier still because they're being forced to pay to be there, to complete an ed educational degree in a technical field. And they consistently are looking at me when they show up and they ask, why do I have to take this class? The reality is that they're going into an industry that doesn't seem to care about the kinds of critical thinking skills that I promise my students they're going to learn in the English and philosophy classes. I've sold the pitch many times. This class will help you build critical thinking skills unlike any other class. And while I believe my classes, English classes and philosophy classes, are a value, and that they can teach incredible critical thinking, th critical thinking skills, I'm curious about whether or not it is my place to force what I consider a value upon a student who doesn't want to be there. Is it any of my business to tell someone who says he wants nothing more than to just have a job and do his job day in and day out that he needs to prepare to try to be more to hopefully, don't you want to manage one day? Don't you want to open your own business? Some don't. They are happy being employees and just doing what they're told to do. 
So let me tell you about how important these critical thinking skills are to future employers in the technical field especially. I'd mentioned NDT classes. As it turns out, the college where I teach has the number one non-destructive testing program in the nation. That's what NDT stands for. Non-destructive testing. I had no idea what this was. Finally, I had a student explain it to me. And actually, and it was a female student. You don't get many females in the NDT program. But the female student, she told me, she said, think about it this way. If a bridge is built, I am the last person on that bridge testing it for stability before it is opened for use. Non-destructive testing. Now, one thing has changed the landscape of the non-destructive testing field, unlike anything you can imagine. The pictures here are of North Dakota, the oil fields. I don't know if you've been following what's going on in North Dakota. I mean, you've probably heard there's oil there. But I grew up in North Dakota, living in the neighboring Minnesota. It is stunning and shocking what's taking place there. Roads, if you see this picture on the left here. I used to drive these roads with a book on the steering wheel so I could read because they were so long, straight, and boring, and you never passed another car. This is what they look like today. Last time I drove home, my mom said, how was the drive? I said, stressful. <laughs> it had never been stressful to drive through North Dakota before. The other pictures, I don't know if you've heard the word, the term man camps. That's what they're called. These are the man camps set up all over North Dakota now. There are no longer houses. There's no place for these people to live, so they park tents and trailers in empty lots, and they go to work. Our NDT students are in high demand. And as it turns out, many of them are being recruited before they finish their degree. I'll tell you about one student in particular. I'll even tell you his name. <laughs> he is an amusing man. He signed up for community college and wanted to become, uh, to go into the NDT field. Of course, he was told he would need to take the developmental English classes. Coll one semester of college level writing is a requirement for the NDT course. This poor boy had absolutely no English skills. I mean, he could communicate verbally just fine. Writing was abysmal. He had a really good attitude, though. My colleague Mary had him in the English 94, which is the upper, actually, I think she had him in the lower level English development, cla English development class first. He passed, then got into the higher level development class and failed. I ended up having him on a second round, and it took a lot of work. And uh, he finally passed. Well, as it turns out, people from the oil fields came down and did a large recruitment process of NDT people. They offered him a six-figure job. He bought a camper and a Harley and took off for the oil fields. His sister, I had his sister in class last semester, and he and I talked on the day of her graduation. His sister was on his case. She said, you need to get back here and finish that English degree. I looked at her and I said, why? Why? She's like, well, he has to finish his degree. He has to get it done. I'm like, why? And her brother Jeff also looked at her and he's like, I'm making six figures a year. This oil is going nowhere. Why do I need to come back here and learn how and go through the truly what would end up being sort of a hellacious journey, I think, for him to, to complete the English class. He's, he's been hired to do what he needs to do, and he's doing it well and making an amazing salary. Finishing the English class is not going to change that. It's only going to require that he take one semester away from a very lucrative job. I could say, now, and it's difficult. I have to tell you, it's a difficult position to be in. Because there are some good reasons, I think a person could argue, to require 
students to take classes they might not otherwise take or might not want to take. One of the biggest reasons is that we want well-rounded citizenry. We want them to be, you know, critical thinkers. We need them to, you know, know what they're doing when they go out and vote. And I had one really rewarding experience this last semester. I had another really pissed off NDT student sitting in my English classroom. Didn't want to be there, didn't see the value in English, hated English. But he said I was committed to doing it because it was required and I just wanted to get it done so I could like just really get in and focus on my field of study. First paper came around. He'd never read a book in his life, he admitted to me. Ever. So he finished his, uh, he read the first book, kind of freaked out about the whole idea of writing a three to five page paper. He got rolling on it. And he gave me eight pages, eight good pages, really good pages. When we read One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, he totally related to uh, McMurphy. Totally related to McMurphy. Loved the book. He wrote a 13-page paper on that book, a fantastic paper. By the end of the semester, this guy was so engaged in conversations, he was writing amazing papers. He finally came to see me at the end of the semester. He said, I never thought I would enjoy English, and now I think I'm going to take it on as a minor. I said, are you kidding me? He's like, no, and I need a reading list too. I said, all right, I'll put one together for you. An amazing story. And stories like that are often used by my English colleagues. This is why we have to you know, encourage them to get them in these classes. They don't know what they're missing if they're not there. But I keep thinking, is that my job? Is that our responsibility? We are doing a disservice to a consumer. Primary education in high school is not, I would not consider those students consumers. They are recipients. College is a choice, or so we say. Even if people feel like there is no other option, it seems like that sort of negates the idea of a choice. But if college is truly a choice, then why are they coming to school and being forced to pay for classes they don't want to take and that don't really relate to the program? If English instructors and philosophy instructors want students in their class and they find their classes valuable, I think it's their job to sell it. To, to make, it's got, it should be optional and not required. The number of students who have come into these classes, digging their heels in, far outweigh the number of students who have fulfilled the classes and been thankful for them. And it seems we're doing a, a big disservice to those students, straddling them with higher debts to take classes they don't want to take. In the end, what I would like to say is that college students have little power of what they are purchasing. They can certainly choose the program they wish to study, but then they are forced to purchase every good required by the college. Whether the student or future employers find it valuable or not, whether it directly pertains to the field they are studying or not, and so long as we continue to force college as a value upon, student, upon potential students, young people, as long as we continue to think in this country that the college is the ticket to a better future, we are going to continue to see these problems in the college atmosphere. We are going to continue to have students who are absolutely incapable of completing a college degree show up and be straddled with unbelievable college debt, and yet still be dishwashers. So what is the answer? I'm not really sure. I think uh, great changes need to be made in our high school education. The whole idea that you can graduate at the age of 18 and be considered an adult, and yet have no skills to give you a true occupation to support yourself, is, is pretty abysmal. The whole notion that you're going to graduate from high school and then be required to spend at least $40,000 of your own money to be employable is disastrous. So 
I am now open for questions. I don't have a question as much as a comment. Um, I'm, some of you know I am a fourth grade teacher in New York, and I see BOCES programs closing down all over the country. They're not providing, we're not providing technical training to our high school students as they begin to leave high school. And in conjunction with that, in Europe, it's my understanding that if you don't pass a certain level of competency at a certain point, you're not even allowed to go to college, that you are, um, I don't want to say Directed shunned, toward directed, the technical field. Exactly, directed toward technical field. And I, it just breaks my heart. I completely, I hear everything you're saying, and it just breaks my heart. I don't know where these kids are going to go. I don't either. In another part of the of the real tragedy of all of this, I was speaking with a friend. The he's now a friend. The student that went off to William Mitchell Law School has ultimately become a friend of mine. And we were talking the other day because before he had come back to college, he was in the construction field and he worked as a welder. Our school, you know, it's a um, community college and technical college. We have a welding program. He told me he's like, I don't even understand why anyone would take the welding program. He said, because you don't need a certificate to get a job as welder. You need an apprenticeship. You go, exactly, it's a way to make more money. You're straddling these students with more debt that they don't need. But if they don't know how else to do it, they're heading straight to the college to try to be trained for something. Do you think that this current direction in our country is a result of the race to the top, no child left behind, this, this um, you know, from the executive branch of the government on down, this trickle down thing, this idea that everybody has to go to college, is it coming from that? Or what do you think? I think it's a, par a part of it, but I think it began even before that, because I remember even in high school, and I graduated in 1990, but I remember, you know, planning out my, my high school classes. The question was, are you planning to go on to college? You should. If you want to be anything later on, you need a high school diploma or a college degree. And so they would, like, set you up. And at least for, it, 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 when I was in high school, we still had the shop classes where they did carpentry and all that stuff. But you could, t you could choose a path. But I think... Since 1990, it was probably in the in the 90s where that was really redefined. That you know, not, you're not even really going to get a, a chance anymore. We're getting rid of the we're getting rid of the vocational classes. Everybody is going to be guided toward the college path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. College is no longer. And I, I, I mean, I'm speaking in generalizations here, but it's like college has really, in many ways, just become a finishing school. Yeah. It's finishing off what the high school has failed to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know the, the answer either to this, but I, I know three people that, for various reasons, either didn't finish high school or couldn't go right to college and things happened in their lives. And the three cases that I know, one became a lawyer, as someone you said. Um, one is a teacher in California. I'll finish four-year college. One lawyer. And then... Another one went from two, a two-year college to a very prestigious four-year college. And it was a bridge for these people, and it provided a very, very valuable service. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they would have made it without it. What, the one that's the teacher did the, the, the English thing that you're saying, where she had to go to two separate classes to even be qualified to start. They didn't let her start college at all until she did the two classes, so she couldn't take philosophy. Okay, go ahead. But it was a really valuable thing for these three individuals. So I don't know the answer. I mean, forcing, you know, you know, setting up a society where that's the only expectation is obviously a problem. All these people, by the way, self financed They all worked, so they didn't end up with, with debt from community college. So I, there, there's a good side to community college, too, I guess. There is absolutely, and I don't mean to give the wrong impression, there is absolutely a good side. And I think it's best, number one, for the students who absolutely know they want to go on to a four-year, get a four-year education. It's incredible for older, for we call them now non-traditional students, who have gone off and they've had some other experiences, and they have decided, this is what I want. I want to do this. And they are there and they're committed, and they really, it really isn't, amazing step for them. It's the ones, I think, where it's this idea, well, I have nothing else to do, so I'll go to college. Isn't that what everyone's doing? 
or I'm just expected to be there, so I better go there. They're the ones who I think are placing a huge burden, not only on the teachers, but on this, this debt crisis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What a compelling conversation this has become. My name is Heather Wagenhals, and, and I have a radio show about money management. And what I find that's provocative is, uh, while the statistics say that 87% of millionaires are college graduates, it's not a requirement to be successful. And I think what I find is interesting is, I wound up having to drop out of college not necessarily by choice, but more by circumstance, and having to provide for and take care of my mother financially, since I was the oldest, was what my role was. And I almost feel like my having to enter the business world a little prematurely, uh, but still nonetheless hungry, served me very well, and I was able to make um, copious amounts of money in spite of not having an education and finding that my commitment to being a voracious reader uh, served me better by reading nonfiction books by people who have been in the marketplace doing what I was doing than I actually learned in academia. And I almost wonder if the, the position that you said about those non-traditional students that return by choice as opposed to not having anything else to do would be a better avenue for folks to go out and get life experience first before they actually go and the commitment and success rates would be higher. Could you speak to that point? I, I would absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And actually, as I was writing, you know, getting ready for this presentation, I was thinking about my grandfather and my father-in-law. And, and both of them, my father-in-law is 80 and my grandfather is 91. Both of them, my, well, the 91-year-old grandfather is a retired farmer, but my father-in-law is still a very active farmer. And... Uh, it's really, I mean, if you think about the messages that get relayed is that you can go nowhere without a college degree. You can expect nothing more than to be flipping hamburgers. And I think my grandfather and my father-in-law never had more than an eighth, eighth grade education. They're both incredibly bright men. We have stimulating conversations every election year. They're informed voters. And they're incredibly successful businessmen running successful farms. Today, it seems like we would be giving this, we would be implying you need a, because we have ag programs now, agriculture programs. You have to go off and get a degree in agriculture. It's not necessary. And I absolutely agree. For a lot of students, I, I and I don't want to say it, would be, it should be mandatory. Absolutely not. But a, what a huge benefit to take a, at least one year after high school Go work in Vail and, and operate the lifts, the ski lifts. Meet some people, get some life experiences on your belt. So many students who leave high school and go to college have never spent a day without their, their parents' financial help or without being under their roof. Go, live on your own, do something, struggle for a while, figure out what it is you wanna do before you show up and get a degree in political science and then end up working in advertising. You know, one thing that you hadn't addressed that I'm curious about is where do you think this pressure, because I was a, a child of the 80s too, and it, it was not, you know, well, where are you going to college? It's, are you? Have you thought about it? Perhaps, maybe. So where do you think that this prevailing attitude is all of a sudden that it seems like we must go to college? It's like not an option. I'm not even sure where that, where the, where that, the root is for that. And, um, but it was sometime after I had graduated in, in the mid to late 90s, maybe as a result of the No Child Left Behind, I don't know, a bigger push, a bigger push by colleges to try, I mean, think about how much money colleges have these days. Many colleges and universities are worth so much money. When you think about University of Chicago when I was there, they had enough in an endowments to pay the full year's tuition for all of their students for like the next five to 10 years. It's become a money-making business and I think they're, they're capitalizing on it largely, unfortunately. 
But it is, it's true. It is no longer the question, are you planning to go? And it seems like now, and I even catch myself, I meet people, where did you go to college? Just making the assumption. Yes. Hi, my name is Diego and I'm from UFM. Um, there was one example that um, I would like to talk about. And it was the example of the dishwasher uh, guy. So I'm trying to understand what you were saying uh, about Okay, so he was going, without the college degree, he was going to be a dishwasher. And with the college degree, he, is, he still is going to be a dishwasher. So um, one thing that I, well, don't get me wrong, I do agree that um, college titles are not a, uh, it's tending to be a less uh, valuable certification of, in the labor market. But still, there are people who need uh, to improve skills and to acquire new knowledges and skills to, to improve their certification in, in some sense. So I don't agree in the sense that, um, okay, you go to college and then, uh, well, it's still the same if you go to college or you don't go to college. So basically, um, my, my comment and, and question toward you is that it's not only a part of, of the students uh, who, well, you just told us, have uh, a lot of, of complications and, and a lot of, um, I don't know, diseases and disabilities, uh, but also of the traditional educational system, which is that uh, it tends to um, standardize everything and treat everything, everyone as, as the same. So my question is toward that. Um, what do you think of could be a better method to improve the, the skills of these people. That one is incredibly difficult. Because for example, and I've had this conversation with a couple of my colleagues, we've had many conversations about this topic as I've been preparing for it. And mental illness especially is the difficult one. I would hate to see a time where you're, where you're telling somebody with a mental illness, no, you can't study. You're never gonna be able to do anything with this. I guess my question is, especially, I mean, and then we have people, you know, who suffer from severe depression or bipolarism, or, you know, and I'm not saying that the college education can't be valuable for them, but there are some disabilities that are so severe that it doesn't matter how well they do in college, it doesn't matter if they're able to get the degree. They just don't have the social skills necessary to succeed in, in a traditional workplace. So what do we do about that? I really don't have the answer for you. And like I said, if they're able to afford it on their own, fine. But too often, my fear is that a lot of these students, their education is being paid for by the taxpayer, their grants, um, and then student loans as well. So, I, and again, I don't have answers. My goal and my hope was simply to start opening a discussion that just, I've not heard before. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and, and I ag agree with that because um, if you stick to them with the traditional educational system, of course, maybe uh, the most probable thing is that they, it won't work. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, uh, it could work other methods for them and uh, innovating in, in teaching uh, other skills. Right. So. Well, and exactly. And I think one answer is to bring back the vocational training. Absolutely, that is totally lacking. And there's nothing wrong with being a plumber. Do you know how much plumbers make? Or electricians? And this friend of mine who worked in the construction company, he told me, you have to become a master electrician. You, there are, it's a lot of work, and you have to be really bright, and you have to pass all these tests. He knows one man who did all the tests and became a le master electrician, then called his buddy who's been working in the electrical field for years to ask how to like connect two wires. He knew how to do it on the book, but had no practical skills to take care of it. And just one more question. Um, since you are a teacher in, in these universities, um, what, um, how much field do you have to innovate in these subjects? Because, uh, I mean, you can make a difference within these, these in your classes or in, in this program. So how much field do you have to, to work with that? Like how much leeway do I have? Freedom do I have? Yeah, how much freedom do you have? Luckily, my school gives me all the freedom I need. I can devise my class however I feel is appropriate, and um, and it's I've taken advantage of it. 
And luckily, I mean, I end up having really good enrollment in my classes and nicely, I mean, so I've not had a problem. And um, I found that the Socratic method is really the best. If I can get my students talking and engaged, then they're interested and they stay. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. I just, I just wanted to quickly share what was in yesterday's Wall Street Journal. The title is What's Really Immoral About Student Loans, which I thought was pretty appropriate. One paragraph I wanted to read. Now here's where the real immorality kicks in. The skyrocketing cost of a college education is a classic unintended consequence of government intervention. Colleges have responded to the availability of easy federal money by doing what subsidized industries generally do, raising prices to capture the subsidy. Sold as a tool to help students cope with rising college costs, student loans have instead been a major contributor to the problem. I couldn't agree more. It's true. Hi, I'd actually like to get your opinion on something that we actually we haven't talked about today, but I'm curious to what you think of it. Um, when I was in high school, our minimum class requirement was six classes, and we could take up to eight. While I'm in college, I can only take four a semester, and that equivalents to about 15 hours in the classroom, and I probably do 10 hours outside of the classroom. When I asked my advisor if I can take six classes or even seven classes, he said, no, and this seems to be very much wherever you go to college. What the hell? <laughs> and this is, again, taking away the freedom of the consumer, and especially at the college. I mean, here we have students who are consumers, and we're telling them what they can or cannot do. If I want to pay to take six classes, I mean, they can advise you against it. That's a lot of work and a lot of homework, and by the end of the semester, you may be fried. But in the end, it's your choice. You're taking the risks, and you're paying for it. So I'm not really, I, I don't understand dictating those kinds of policies to students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just love how you gave an entire lecture without mentioning objectivism, and yet it was clearly underpinned with objectivist principles, because it seems pretty evident that the majority, if not all of the, the civil the philosophical problems you described would have been addressed by people not adopting secondhand values and adopting their own values and their own lives as a value instead of just accepting what other people give them as value. Is that, does that seem right to you? Can you write that down? That would be a way better conclusion to my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.